Okay, I haven't got anyone, anyone at all, please just put in, if you can hear me, please put in uh, OK into the question box. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. It's a bit worried then. I thought maybe the microphone might be broken or something like that. Um, well, thank you for joining us, everybody, this evening. And um, this this webinar tonight is is targeted primarily at people who either um, openly admit that they don't know enough about property or uh, secretly inside know that there might be, they might have some experience but there's a few little gaps and they just want to make sure that they understand things correctly. Either way, uh, you have the anonymity of uh, your own lounge room this evening so uh, I hope you get something out of it. Um, but if you are an experienced investor and, you know, this, this does seem to be a bit, beneath you, that's okay, this is not designed for you, this is designed for people who are starting from scratch. Uh, I often say to people that the difference between the rich and the poor is not money. The difference between the rich and the poor is knowledge and that is how, um, you know, a lot of rich kids end up rich in their own right, not because they got a, uh, a leg up financially from their parents but because they got an education from their parents and unfortunately a lot of people from poor families they don't get an education and they themselves become poor. And I guess we all have to look at our own situation, look at our parents, look at the people around us growing up, how financially successful were they and, uh, and are we happy with that? And, and if we're not, we'll have to, we'll have to uh, recognise that maybe we're not as competent um, with our financial knowledge as we would like to be and we come along to things like this and, and we do what we can to fix it up. So well done uh, for coming along tonight. Uh, I'm very passionate about property. I love talking about it. And, uh, and I'm very uh, grateful to have you all listening in this evening. So without any further ado, let's, let's get into it. Okay, so a quick pop quiz. Uh, here's, here's some questions that uh, will be answered during this webinar. And uh, perhaps I just want you to ask yourself honestly whether you know the answer to these or not. Okay, what does LBR stand for? What is equity? When people talk about equity, what are they actually talking about? What is a rental yield and how is it calculated? How much money does it cost to acquire a property? Or what are the, probably a better way to ask that question would be, what are all the different things that go into calculating the acquisition cost of a property? How much of your money does it cost to hold a property? So you know, how do you work that out? How do you work out uh, what all the expenses are and therefore whether the rent and the tax return are going to pay the bills or not. And what factors make property values go up? If you don't know what factors make property values go up, you probably shouldn't be buying any properties at the, until you do because you're going to buy them in the wrong place and you probably won't, chances are you're not going to make any money. Uh, property investing is just like any other form of investment. You should be in it to make yourself a profit and if you don't know what factors drive prices up, then you're from the, at the outset behind the eight ball in regards to whether you're going to be successful or not. But don't worry, we'll be talking about that tonight as well. Okay, so why invest in property? I think you could put a very fair argument that, that property of all the investment streams, residential property at, at the least, would be the, the lowest and most manageable in terms of risk. The stock market's very volatile, currency trading very volatile, um, you know, commodities very volatile. Uh, but property, as long as people need somewhere to live and the population keeps growing up, you know you're going to be okay with property. Sure, there might be short-term dips for 5-10% losses in value. If you go to uh, regional towns or somewhere like that, you might see even more extremes. But if you're playing a long-term game and you're in it for 5-10 to 10 years, then you're, then you're always going to make money in property and you're certainly not going to lose your money. Um, and, uh, and, and for that reason, um, property is very, very attractive. And we all know, and if we don't, we should, that we must be investing. It's not optional anymore um, in Australia to not be investing. Uh, if you don't invest, when you get to the end of your life, you, will, you may well own your home, but if you've got nothing else in reserve, if you don't have a passive income coming from somewhere else, the pension, if it still exists by then, uh, is not enough to live on. At the moment, it's less than 15 grand a year. And, uh, you know, in this day and age, it doesn't go very far. 
when you think about electricity bills and the cost of petrol and the, the cost of food and even rates bills and things like that that you're going to have to pay in your retirement. Fifteen, the pension doesn't go far enough. So we must be investing. And, and if we've, we're afraid of investing, well, the way we fix that fear is to gain knowledge. Because when you have the knowledge, you'll then be able to act with confidence and you'll be able to set yourself up so that the things that could go wrong don't go wrong and that if they do go wrong, um, despite your best efforts to avoid them, you'll have a plan in place to mitigate that uh, any damage that may occur. All right, property is an appreciating asset, goes up in value. So it's, uh, you know, you can go and get some debt and you can load it up on a property and know that that property is going to end up worth more than the debt, not less than the debt, unlike a car or anything like that. Tax benefits, there's fantastic tax benefits and we'll talk in detail about that. But basically in this country, the Australian government encourages property investors to buy properties because if it wasn't for property investors, think about this, if there were no property investors, all the people who can't afford to buy their own home would be dependent on government housing. And if 50% of the adult population is renting, that's a lot of people. And that's a big bill for the government to pay. Um, and so the government has incentives for you to invest and they include tax breaks and we'll talk about how they work later on. Higher leverage. What that means is that you can borrow up to 95% in, in some cases of the value of the property from the bank and chip in the rest for yourself. So it allows you to have, instead of having, you know, you, know, you might have 50, 60, 70 grand cash but you can turn that in to a half a million dollar asset that sits in the market and when the market moves 10%, you make 50 grand. Um, and as a result, your, the return on your initial investment is quite, quite dramatic um, as opposed to uh, what you might try and do with shares or something like that where you're probably mad to, to gear yourself up like that with borrowed money and put on the share market. But you can do it in the, in the, the residential property market because it's a lot less risky and a lot less volatile. Okay, you can safely expect it to appreciate faster than inflation over time as demand for land increases. As long as they're not making any more land and they're making more people, then property prices are going to go up in value. Um, and as such, you know, the, the, the cost of houses goes up far in excess of inflation. Um, so inflation is usually you know, pegged at 2 to 3% per year and that's how interest rates are decided. They try and keep inflation in that bracket. And then if inflation is getting too high, they'll put interest rates up and that in turn will slow all the mortgage holders down and they'll stop spending their money and that will de-stimulate the economy. If, if, the, uh, if, the economy, if inflation is low and the economy is stalling, then they'll put interest rates down and it stimulates the economy. So we know that inflation um, sort of sits at about 2 to 3% per annum because there's a mechanism to control it. Now, if you've got money in a savings account and it's earning you, you know, 4% per annum and then you're getting taxed, which is good, by the way, for a savings account, and then you're getting taxed on that, you're only ending up with, you know, 3%, well, you're barely covering inflation. So money sitting in a savings account is just keeping up with inflation. Money put into a leveraged asset like property, however, as you'll see tonight, it will, will do far, far better than that. Okay, so... Who would like to know how to get 258% return in one year on your money? Because I don't have to tell you if you don't want me to. <laughs> Those of you who just joined us, thank you for joining. Um, you're in trouble with the teacher already for being a little bit late. No, that's okay. I'm just joking around. <laughs> Life gets in the way, slows us down. I just, I'm going to talk about something I did where, where we got this return and I just want to share with you. I just want to make sure you're all still paying attention though. If you want me to proceed, put something in your question pot, put me, otherwise I'll refuse to, to advance. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Just making sure you're there. Thank you, Nathan. You're the only one out of many. Oh, Kath, thank you, Kath. The only two out of a very large audience who had the guts to say something. Oh, now everyone's saying stuff. Okay. Right, I say. <laughs> yes, yes, I'll do my best. <laughs> Make me rich, Nathan says. Um, so 258% in one year. Now, look, look. I'll admit up front, this is a very good result and it doesn't happen every year, but this is the sort of stuff that is possible in property. And let me talk you through uh, what we did. Okay. Once I worked out my golden rules of property investing, and, they, and those who heard me speak before, you know, the first rule is to buy where it's booming, and the second rule is to make sure they pay for themselves. 
I went and found out where it was booming and I bought two properties there. I knew that there were some things going on. I knew there was a lot of jobs being created, a lot of money coming into that local economy. And I went and bought two properties within the space of about three months. The first property was this was 470k in value. I put a 10% deposit down. I had about 23 grand in stamp duty and, and mortgage insurances and things like that to go on. And so the total transaction cost of that property was about 70 grand. It cost me 70 grand of my money to get in there. But of course, the 47 grand was the deposit, so that sort of stayed in the equity. And uh, the 423 grand loan. Once I betted that one in, I quickly went and got another one for 620. And that sounds expensive. And a lot of people won't buy property that expensive because of, because of this fear they have. But I knew this property was a cracker and I knew it was in a good location. It was worth extending myself a bit. But this time, interestingly enough, I only went in with 5%. And it cost me a bit more in cost because the mortgage insurance was much higher and the stamp duty was higher because the property was a bit more expensive, about 30 grand. So I got in there for 61k. The loan ended up being 589. And then what happened? Well, well in terms of my own money that I chipped in, I put 131,000. If you add that 70 grand to the 61 grand, there's your 131,000. So I went and put that in. And then what happened? Well, in 12 months in that location, the place went bananas and the first property went up in value to 600k the loan was no change and so the total equity uh, situation in that case was uh, 177k okay so the equity being the value minus the loan right the next property went up to 750 so they, each of them went up 130k each loan no change so the total equity position increased so basically for my 131k that I put in, I ended up having 338k of equity. Okay, So we've got 177 there and 161 there gives us 338. Now that's a 258% return on your money that you put in. Can you see, you should be able to see by that the power, you should be able to see by that the power of the uh, of this leverage effect of borrowing money to get a, an asset in the market and when that asset goes up you make a lot more money. Um, okay, let me just, uh, I've just got a technical problem here. There are people who can hear me right. If you can hear me just put A-OK. I think I've got, Dennis is having a bit of trouble hearing me. Dennis, can you, thank you Nathan. Dennis, can you confirm that you can hear me? All right. I'm just going to put a little note in here for Dennis. Okay, hopefully we'll get that. Right, so moving right along. All right, so this is the sort of thing that's possible with property. If you if you are looking to get a result, the leverage is where it's at. But of course. You've got to be very careful about where you buy. And one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they buy locally. They buy nearby because they want to keep an eye on the property or they rationalise that they know their own area well um, or that if something's wrong with it, they can sneak around to fix it. And that's an interesting statement because, yes, if something's wrong with it, you can sneak around and fix it yourself and maybe save yourself a couple of hundred bucks uh, in maintenance costs. That's fair. That's a fair point. However... You do, if you go and buy where it's booming, there's always somewhere booming in Australia. If you go and buy where it's booming, you could be making 50, 100, and in my case, 130 grand a year per off each property. Now, this is what, what you're denying yourself. So it's very important that you get your, get your head right and get in the right space psychologically about, about property investing and what you're actually in it for. Uh, you know, I, I've, I met a gentleman the other week who uh, he said he owned, uh, I think he said 14 properties. And I said, oh, that's, that's fantastic, well done. And this guy was 65. He'd been investing since he was 20. And I said, where are all these properties? And he said, oh, well, I've got some in, in, uh, in this place. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And he ended up telling me he had them all in the same street. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And uh, he had this idea in his head that he's going to buy the whole street. And he said to me, he said, well, it took me, you know, near on 50 years to do it. But I've, uh, you know, every time a house come up for sale in the street, he bought it. Now, that's really interesting. And, uh, and that's kind of got a romantic sort of feel to it, to own the street. I think everyone would love to own their street. But the problem with that is, of course, he's denied, 
denied himself another opportunity, which would have been if every time he bought a property, he went and bought where it was booming, then he could have accessed equity, bought more property, and instead of having 14 properties, he might have 50 or even 100 by now. So it's, uh, it's interesting. You just got to critically analyse every theory, every suggestion, and every thought in your head and go, okay, is that, does that make sense or not, or could it be done better? Okay. So it's all about your mindset. You know, limiting beliefs and obstacles are what slow us down. Remember, the difference between the rich and the poor is money. Sorry, it's not money. That was a quick <laughs> fraudulent slip. The difference between the rich and the poor is education. It's knowledge about how to make money. And when you have that education, the money will come. But if you don't know what you're doing, it won't. It's as simple as that. And I guess, again, that's why we're here tonight. Okay, but also it's, a, it's also, you know, not only just the knowledge, but th that psychological aspect how you think about things, and, and how you think about things, of course, comes from your education, I suppose. And um, you know, Some people say, oh, look, if I buy a property, the market will collapse, or interest rates will go up, I'll lose my job, I'll get tenants from hell. Um, you know, I was never going to be rich, I'm not one of those people. Or, you know, or they have, they've, there was somebody in their life that told them that rich people were bad people and they don't want to be a rich person. Or, or they convinced themselves that, um, they don't need money because money is not the key to a good life. And uh, to a certain extent that's true and we'll talk a bit about that in a second. But what, what we do know is that money is an important enabler to doing a lot of things that we want to do. Um, and the other thing I guess we've got to realise is that strategies that worked 20 years ago and, a pro and money mindsets from 20 years ago don't apply now. 20 years ago they're only just introducing super. The old age pension was quite significant and, and it was respectable amount. Uh, now it's it's a pittance. Um, now you, the government is not going to be there for you in retirement. Now it's all up to you. So you know, paying your house off um, first and then worrying about investing later, it's not going to work. It's too slow a method. You need to be thinking about doing things other ways. One way, rather than trying to pay your house off, maybe what you should be doing is trying to buy more houses. And hold, and hold those houses in the market because you've got to ask yourself, if you've got a $500,000 property and the market moves 10%, well, you make 10 grand. Or, well, sorry, you make 50 grand. But if you've got $2 million worth of property and the market moves 10%, well, how much money have you made then? And then how quickly could you pay off your original home if you had four houses all earning equity and then you, then you sold a couple off the end and paid off the other one? Isn't that a smarter strategy? Worth thinking about. Okay, so and I, this is what I say to people. You don't necessarily have to listen to me. Only listen to the people uh, who you want to achieve the same success as. If, uh, you know, and what makes sense to you. Just be very, very careful because there will be people around you who will try and knock you down at every turn. They go, oh, I'll buy an investment property big time, eh? My own father said to me when I started getting investment properties, he said to me, so you're going to become a capitalist pig, are you? And uh, fortunately for me, I was older enough and wise enough to see through that and understand that that's, that's a debilitating sort of approach, you know. And, uh, and so I just said, well, you know, I said, actually, what I actually said to him is, that, yes, Dad, I am, absolutely. <laughs> so anyway, um, and watch out for the Monday's experts. You know those people in the, in the morning tea room and the, the people who, say, who, who are experts at everything. Um, look, if, if, if they know what they're talking about, they know what they're talking about. But if they don't, they don't. And um, just because they may be an expert in one area doesn't mean they're, they're an expert in another. I've seen dentists who get paid really, really well do atrociously stupid things with property investment. You know, I've seen all sorts of high-income professionals who oh, I'm sure are very, very intelligent, capable in their profession, but when it comes to property, they've got no idea what they're doing. And in every, in every endeavour... In every field of endeavour, there are people who know what they're doing and people who aren't. And just make sure you're listening to the right people. Okay, so why invest in property? You know, is money the root of all evil? Well, here's what I'd say to it. Is educating your children evil? Is getting the best doctors possible should, God forbid, you ever get ill or one of your family members get ill? Is that evil? Is travel evil? Is giving the charity evil or even maybe one day starting your own charity? Is having a few uh, recreational toys for you to enjoy your downtime, is that evil? Probably not. And is spending time with your family, is that evil? Now, well, the reality is all those things have one thing in common. Does anyone want to guess what that is? 
All these things have one thing in common. Throw it in your uh, throw it in your question box. Money. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you online now, Dennis. Money. Okay. Money is what they have in common. So look, I agree. If if your obsession is with your bank account, then you probably are a sick puppy, and you probably need to get some help. But if you if that's not your if you want to do these sorts of things, well then that's perfectly normal. And we realise that money allows us to do these things. Money is a necessary, um, you know, uh, facilitator of doing all these things we want to do. And uh, the, the strange thing is people sort of, they make stories for themselves and say, well, it's not all about money. And, you know, so I'm not obsessed with money. I just want to live comfortably and that'll do me fine. And that's okay. But, you know... The only people they are not serving is themselves by doing that, and they'll never have the opportunity. To, the poor people can't, you know, can't. Uh, they're going to be. They can't look after others if they can't look after themselves, and it's that simple. Even spending more time with your family, the implied task there is that if you want to spend more time with your family, you've got to spend less time at work, and the reason why we work is to get income. So the only way we can get away from that is to try and get a passive income from some other source, namely investments. So what I say to my clients is if your goals relate not to a bank balance, not to a certain amount, not to so many properties, not to um, a certain dollar figure, but if your goals relate to all these things that you want to do with your life, have children, send them to the best schools, travel the world, support your charities, um, you know, start your own charity, uh, you know, go on some expedition, I don't know, um, start your own business, spend more time with your kids, be able to support your kids when they enter the adult world, uh, maybe they're already there and you want to give them a hand, all of these things you need to have, you know, not be dependent on your children when you, when you retire and you run out of money and they have to pay your bills for you, you know, that sort of thing, all these things. So keep that in mind when you're investing. It should motivate you like nothing else. Okay, so here's one of those things that we get told. We all get told debt is bad. Debt is bad. Don't carry debts. Don't owe anyone any money. You know, make sure you pay your bills, son. You know, things like that. These are the messages that were put in your head when you were younger. And um, and in, the problem with it is it's half true because there is such thing as bad debt. But there's also such thing as good debt. And as a property investor or investor of any description, you need to understand the difference. And it is simply this. Good debt is money that's used, is debt that's used to buy assets that go up in value. Bad debt is debt that's used to buy assets that go down in value, such as cars and jet skis and weddings and holidays and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of us, especially when we're young, we go, you know what, I want to really want to get that nice car and I really want to go on that holiday. So we get ourselves into bad debt and we put ourselves behind the eight ball from the get-go. And the debt keeps going up and the, the asset that we bought keeps going down. And then we get into this, you know, this spiral where things start going the wrong direction. Whereas if we all just went and bought a property first, then we could probably buy a car after that and not feel so bad because the car may go down in value but the property is going to go up and going to go up in value far in excess of that and therefore, you know, we're going to be going ahead. And what I say to people is don't worry about your good don't worry about your good debt, but certainly take your bad debt serious. And don't worry, I'm not saying either that you shouldn't buy cars or get jet skis or go on holidays. What I say to people is just as long as your investment decisions are making you more money than your lifestyle decisions are spending, then that's okay, you're going forward. But if you've got that around the wrong way, then you need to put the handbrake on and stop because you know where you're going to end up if you're doing that the wrong way. Right, good debt versus bad debt. Another example of good debt might be, say I own a shop and I want to, um, but the problem is I don't have any stock to sell. So I go to the bank and I say, Mr. Bank Manager or, or Miss Bank Manager, can I please buy $100,000? And they say, what do you want it for? And I say, I want it because I want to buy some stock and I want to sell that stock. And they say, well, have you got any assets to secure the debt against in case you can't pay it back? I say, yes, I've got this shop. You can use the shop as security. And they say, no problem, here's your $100,000. So I go and I buy my stock and I sell it for two hundred grand. And then I go back to the bank and I say, thank you, bank manager. Here's the hundred grand you lent me. 
and here's 10 grand interest and I'll keep the 90 grand, thanks very much. And is that not good? a good use of debt? That of course is good use of debt. Buying investment property, good use of debt. And uh, it's, there's an old saying that said, no one ever got wealthy without getting into debt. But the key point there is of course knowing the difference between what is good and what is bad. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so what is an LVR? LVR stands for Loan to Value Ratio. Any self-respecting property investor should know what that means and should be able to calculate the LVR of a property uh, very, very quickly. Okay, so how does it work? Well, in this case, we've got a property that's worth $500,000 and it's got a loan on it for four fifty. dollars So therefore, the loan to value ratio is four fifty dollars is to five hundred, dollars or as a percentage, that's 90%. Simple as that, okay? Loan to value ratio, how much is the loan as a percentage of the value of the property? Why is this important? It's important because you need to know what equity you have in your property and how much money you can borrow against the property at any one time. And uh, when you're doing your property investing and you're trying to work out what's possible and what's not, it's all part of it. Okay, next one, rental yield. What is a rental yield? Okay, the rental yield, in this, in this example, let's say we've got a $500,000 property and it's renting for five fifty dollars a week. Okay, or twenty eight thousand six hundred a year. What the way a rental yield is calculated is how much rent do you get back per year as a percentage of the total value of the property? Okay, how much is the annual rent as a percentage of the total value? So in this case, if we've got twenty eight thousand uh, twenty eight thousand six hundred over the value, which is five hundred thousand times one hundred, to give us a percentage. So the rental yield on that property is five point seven two five point seven two percent rental yield. And uh, why is that important? There's a little thing called the 1% rule that Steve McKnight came up with. It basically says if you're going to go and borrow 100% of the money to buy a property, well then you know the interest, and if the interest rate's say 5% where it is now, well you know that the interest is going to be, if you know the rental yield is 28 and the interest is, is less, well then you know that the thing's probably going to pay for itself. And what he says is the 1% rule says as long as the rental yield is 1% higher than the interest rate, then the property should pay for itself. And that is obviously the, the extra 1% is to pay for all the additional costs above the interest on the loan, such as the rates, management fees and um, insurances, maintenance, etc. Okay, so that's how rental yields calculated. It is the annual rent as a percentage of the value of the property. And what good, remember my two golden rules, write them down if you've got a bit of paper. Always buy where it's booming and make sure your properties pay for themselves. Now one of the biggest mistakes property investors make is they go and buy properties that don't pay for themselves. Properties where the rental return is so low that it ends up being negative cash flow or negatively geared. And they end up burning a hole in their pocket. They buy one property and then they buy another and then they realise they don't have any disposable income anymore. They're not going to the movies or dinner anymore. They're having trouble making ends meet. All their cash savings have start disappearing and they wonder why what's going on and they say, geez, this property investing is not very good, not all it's cracked up to be and then they sell the property for a loss, they sell it prematurely um, and they lose They lose basically because of the stamp duty on the way in and the, uh, the agents commission on the way out wipe out any sort of potential capital growth they've made, if any, and, uh, and you know, they jump out of bed too early. If you make sure your properties pay for themselves, you'll never feel the need to sell them. And if you never feel the need to sell them, you're going to hold them forever and, and then you'll be still holding it in 10 years time when it's doubled in value or, or you know which is what properties historically done um, in the last 40 years anyway. Okay, so what's equity then? Let's so say same so we've got a property 500,000 and it's got a loan for 275. Now, equity when we just talk generically equity is the difference between the value of the property and the loan. Okay, so in this case as you can see there, what have we got 225 grand is the equity. Okay? Now we can't, uh, and people, I say, it's funny, I get, another one is that people say, oh, I don't own my house, the bank does. And always have a bit of a laugh about that is, no, you do, if you own your house, you own your house. Your name's on the title. The government titles office has you recorded as the owner. It's just the bank has a mortgage, which basically says that if you don't pay the mortgage, then they will own the house. <laughs> they will then seize ownership of the house and sell it. But um, you own the house. Now, your equity in your property is part of your net worth. Okay, if you sold the property and paid the loan out, well, that's that's what the equity would be, and of course you'd have a couple of transaction costs to take out of that. But 
In this case, that's what equity. But then we talk about another thing called available equity. Now, when we're property investing, we can use the available equity in a property to go and buy more properties with. So if the, the limit that you can borrow is 90% on a property, well then available equity is the difference between the loan and the 90% line. So some of you who are, well, majority of you who are listening tonight and watching tonight will have properties. And you think about, okay, so what I want you to do is just quickly think about, get a bit of paper and write down if necessary, write down what your property's current value is, what the current loan on it is, what your total equity is, and if the limit is 90%, what's the available equity? So what's the difference between the 90% line and the loan? Because what a lot of people don't know is that you can use available equity, you can raise a loan against that property accessing that available equity and use the funds from that loan to pay the deposit and costs on another property. And so some of you who are listening tonight may, not have, may, be, may have been thinking that the only way you can buy a property is a cash deposit. But actually, if you already own a property, you can buy more property by using available equity. And then you don't need to use any of your own cash at all. And providing that the new property you're getting has got a healthy rent return so that not only does it pay for its own mortgage, but it also covers the increase in the mortgage on your first property. Well, isn't that a good idea? And that's, that's why it's important to understand all these terms. Okay, so what have we discovered? We've covered uh, loan to value ratio is, is the percentage of the value that the loan consists of. Rental yield, percentage of the value that you get back in rent every year. And equity is the difference between the loan and the total value. Available equity is the difference between the loan and the 90% of value. Okay, acquisition costs. Now when you, when you look at any investment property, you should be looking at two things. You should be saying to yourself, how much is this property going to cost me to acquire? And then how much is this property going to cost me to hold after that? And that figure might be a positive figure or uh, the holding figure might be positive or negative. Okay, let's look at acquisition costs. So this property here on the left, $422,500 and it's going to rent for four twenty-two. dollars uh, sorry, four twenty-five dollars a week. So how much is that property going to cost us to buy? Well, if we put a 10% deposit down, it's going to be forty two grand. And then the stamp duty on that property, if it was in Queensland, would be $13,212.50. There'd probably be a loan establishment fee for the mortgage, about five fifty. To send in a building inspector would cost us about five fifty. Quantity surveyor, who's the person who does the depreciation schedule for you, and we'll talk about the importance of that later, $5.90. Cost of a solicitor, we say the client's budget up to $2,000, but you could often be half that. One word on solicitors, stay away from those um, wholesale, you know, conveyancing type companies that um, they, you know, they advertise on price. What they actually do is they charge you a minimum amount, but then if anything goes wrong, anything gets delayed, any um, you have to do any more letters, anything, then, then they have a, a premium rate on top of that which then you end up spending more than you would have spent if you went to a, a good uh, solicitor who, who perhaps had a per perceived to be higher fee up front. Uh, back on acquisition costs, letting fee, $425. Now a letting fee, when you hire a rental manager, they're going to charge you two fees. They're going to charge you a letting fee, which is usually one week's rent, and they're going to take that as a, as a fee for finding you a tenant. And then they're going to charge you a management fee, which is usually 7.5%. Some cases it can be higher, some cases it can be lower, and that's of the rent that they receive. They'll garnish seven and a half percent off the top, and they'll keep that for themselves and give you the rest. So, as an acquisition cost, the letting fee is an acquisition cost, and your total investment in this case is going to cost you just under sixty thousand dollars to buy that property, and the rest of the money is going to come from the bank. Now, one other thing that might you might want to consider there is lender's mortgage insurance, which uh, if you borrow over eighty percent you have to pay the bank for the uh, insurance policy, the lenders mortgage, what they call lenders mortgage insurance. And uh, that is an extra expense. But most banks will allow you to do what they call capitalise that onto the mortgage, which basically means you can add that on top of the mortgage and therefore you don't have to factor it into your acquisition costs because they'll pick up the bill. Okay, so will so could you buy a property? So the first question I guess is uh, if that sort of property is going to cost you sixty grand, 
and in your previous calculation you worked out that you've got available equity of at least 60 grand, you could buy a property today. You could buy that, you know, this week. You could go and get a get talk to a mortgage broker, tell them to raise a, a small loan against your property to get the money for the deposit and cost to get the 60 grand you need and then go and buy this property and get another lender to give you 90%. And whatever you do, don't go with the same lender and we'll talk about that in, in, in if you want to understand why, uh, we'll talk watch one of my more advanced um, webinars. The pre-recorded one on the website explains it. But I don't just because we're talking about beginners tonight, all you need to know is go with a separate lender on every property. Okay, will I be approved for a loan? Okay. Banks can lend you in some cases up to ninety five percent LVR if you have no defaults on your credit file. If you do have a default on your credit file, there are people you can talk to to get that cleaned up and get it wiped. Um, and if you have a problem with that and that's stopping you from going forward with your property investing, then just contact us at info at integrityproperty.com.au. You'll see that at the bottom right corner of the screen. Send us an email and we'll put you in touch with some people who clean up credit files for a living. And they might charge a little bit of money, but um, it would be well worth it because you know every day you're not investing in properties, a day you're not making money from it. And if it costs you a grand or two to get your credit file cleaned up, um, but then you can go and buy an investment property thereafter and start making the big money, uh, well then, well and good. Um, anyway, but yeah, if you, you need to have a clean credit file. Uh, no or low credit card debt and personal loans and a good history of paying them back. Um, ideally, you would have a permanent position and have been in that job for a while and certainly not on any form of probation and have genuine savings. The bank, before they go and lend you money and, and have you ha give you a commitment where you've got to pay it back, they want to see that before then you've been able to save money in a genuine way. Not just being gifted money from mum or dad, but actually have been saving money. And even if it's only a small amount each week, you're consistently putting it away. All right, so taxation. We, we touched on this earlier. How, does a, you know, how do we get a tax break from property investment? And this is really interesting. One, I think this is the, the secret source to being successful in property investing is understanding how taxation works and what sort of properties to buy to give yourself the best tax benefit because often the tax benefit can be the difference between a property that's going to pay for itself and wherever it's not. But on the left-hand side there you can see the current tax brackets for Australia. And remember we have a marginal tax system so we always have a little bit of a laugh when people say oh, I don't want to pay rise because I'll increase my tax. Well it doesn't work that way does it? It works you know, every dollar you earn over 80 grand gets taxed at the lower, at the higher rate, but every dollar below it gets taxed at the lower rate, as per the bracket. So in this case here, let's say we bought this property up the top here, and um, that property is uh, worth 500,000. It's got an 80 percent loan at 400, and a more normal interest rate of 7 percent. Now we know at the moment you can get a property for about 5 percent, but let's just say it's 7 percent. Rent 500 per week or 26 grand per annum. We're earning a hundred grand a year. Maybe you, as an individual, or or as a couple between you, you're getting a hundred grand a year. Uh, and then on on top of that, they will add the rent. When the tax office is doing your tax return, they will add the rent that you've received from that property. So it's an interesting point to note. If you are debt free on an investment property and you're receiving rent, you should expect to pay tax on that on that rent. Okay, but of course. And you know that tends to, that seems to make our situation worse. And if that was all we had, we'd end up with a tax bill, not a tax return. But of course, we've then got our deductions. So what we then do is all the costs associated with holding an investment property are tax deductible. So the twenty-eight grand a year of loan interest is tax deductible. Two grand for rates, tax deductible. Management fees, tax deductible. Insurance, etc. And these things, are what we call cash deductions. Maintenance costs as well. You can claim them on tax. Uh, these are what we call cash deductions. Now, the interesting thing about these is money actually has to leave our bank account for the privilege of claiming them. You know, so whilst we do get some of them back, uh, we're only getting 37% back. We're not getting all of it back. But uh, then here comes the secret source, which is depreciation. Now, 75% of property investors do not claim depreciation, mainly due to ignorance. I would suggest over 90% of people aren't claiming depreciation simply because they don't know what it is. They don't teach this stuff at school. Half of the accountants out there don't even know what it is and how it applies because they weren't taught at school either. And But yet the government allows you to claim depreciation on your investment properties. And if, if, you, don't have, if you don't know what a quantity surveyor is and you don't have a depreciation schedule on your property, 
send us an email at info@integrityproperty.com.au and say, Damien, please help. I need to get a depreciation uh, schedule for my for my property because it could be costing you an arm and a leg. Okay, so you can claim depreciation. What is depreciation? Well, what it is is the the cost. The building is the structure itself, not the land, but the structure itself. The government says, well. In theory, that goes down in value. In theory, the house itself goes down in value, but it's the land that goes up in value. Now, we, of course, know that's not necessarily true, but that's what they do, and they allow you to write the cost of the of the structure off, um, depending on what they're talking about, what fixtures and fittings and, and um, you know bricks and whatever. You can write, write them off at different rates. So you then get what's called a depreciation schedule done up by a quantity surveyor, and they will give you a number you can claim every year. Now, a brand new four bedroom house that's around five hundred grand is going to depreciate for about fifteen grand. Um, you know, so you can put that in a tax deduction. Now, that's what we call a non paper deduction, though, because you didn't give anyone fifteen grand, but you can still claim it on tax. And of course, that gets you in a fantastic situation. So throughout the year, we paid tax on a hundred grand, but now our taxable income is seventy eight grand. So therefore, we pay too much tax. We pay tax on 100. Our assessed taxable income is now 78. Therefore, we paid tax on 21,950. We shouldn't have paid, and therefore, we should get 37 cents the dollar back on that, or 8,000 dollars. Now, a lot of people don't realise there's people. There'll be people watching tonight who were thinking about buying investment property and were thinking about buying a second-hand property that might be 25 years old, and you're about to deny yourself that sort of tax return. So for God's sake, don't do it. Make sure you buy a brand new property if there's a number of reasons for that. We'll talk more about that later. But make sure, if for no other reason, do it to get that big depreciation. Because when you're, how much a week is that? That's 150 bucks a week. And if you average that, you get that tax return, you average that out over 52 weeks, there's 150 bucks right there. So you could have two properties of equal value uh, and they both rent for the same amount. They're both worth, say, 400 grand. But one's 25 years old and one's brand new. The brand new property is going to cost you less to hold because you're going to get a big fat tax return for it. The old property you're not because that depreciation claim is not going to be there. You'll get a smaller tax return, but you certainly won't get a juggernaut one like that. So I might just pause it there and ask for some feedback on how's everyone going with this. I see we've got quite a few people on there now. Just put in your question box. Give me a score out of 10. I'm happy to take feedback. I've got thick skin. I used to be in the army. I've been shot at, so I can handle a bit of criticism. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Thank you. Wow, that's good. Uh, come on, there's plenty of people watching tonight. Don't be afraid. Don't uh, uh, tell me. I need. I just want to make sure you're all still there, all still paying attention. Okay, fantastic. All right, good. I must be doing something right. Well, thank you for your compliments. Yep. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we'll move on. All right, so holding costs. So we talked about acquisition costs, and uh, we know that you know there's stamp duty and legals and all that to pay up front. Now we've got to look at the holding costs. How do we calculate holding costs? And it was important that we took a um, it was important that we took a bit of a detour there and talked about tax because when we're calculating the holding costs of a property, it's really really important that we understand. We look at it not just from a cash flow, like how much rent are we getting and then how much cash is going out the door, but also we look at it as an after-tax situation. So each property will have a pre-tax cash flow and an after-tax cash flow. And often we refer to the after-tax cash flow as gearing. You know, So a pro it is possible that a property could be negative cash flow, i.e. the rent you're receiving is falling short of paying the bills. Um, however, when you then get your tax return back, you end up in front, if that makes any sense, and, and this might help you understand it. So let's say that uh, we bought this property and we had a 92% loan, which was a 90% loan plus 2% capitalised for the mortgage insurance, so that made it ended up being about 92%. So the interest would be $20,909 a year. Rental management fee, 1657 Rates, 1800 Insurance, 1000 Maintenance, 500 bucks. so. Total cash expenses for the year, $25,866. Okay, so if we work out what the uh, what the uh, the rent would be as an annual rent, 
then how much are we in a negative or positive cash flow situation? So if we say 425 times 52 is 22 grand. So that we're only getting $22,100 a week in rent and the cash is more than that. So this property looks like, at first glance, looks like it's going to be negative. Looks like it's going to cost us money and certainly before tax it probably will. But then we get to do our tax deductions and we do our tax return. And we get to put 15 grand of depreciation and 40 grand of deductions. So we end up, and with $22,000 of rent received, we end up in front. So before tax we're behind, but in after tax we get seven grand back in our tax return if, if we're in the 37% bracket. And therefore we end up in front because the rent received is 22 grand, but the tax return is seven grand. So we're actually getting $29,000 in revenue after tax. So a prop, can everyone see how that makes a property may look to be negatively geared before tax, but then it can be positively geared after tax. And uh, well, negative cash flow flow before tax, negative uh, positive geared after tax. And this is really important that people understand because often in the capital cities, the rent returns aren't that crash hot. And but yet a lot of people just want to buy in the capital cities. And if you want to do that, that's okay. But for God's sake, buy a brand new property. Because if you buy the brand new, you'll get that depreciation and then you've got property's got a better chance of paying for itself. Just remember, how many negative properties can you own? How many properties can you own that are costing you money? Let's say they cost you 200 bucks a week after tax. How many of those properties could you own before you ran out of money? So it's really important. So if you're going to buy somewhere where there's a low rental yield, then it's even more important that you're getting that depreciation. The other thing you may want to steer clear of is townhouses and apartments because they have body corporate fees, um, which tend to put up the expenses, but you don't tend to get any extra rent for for the uh, what the body corporate brings. So brand new houses every day of the week, you're going to do a lot better as a general rule. Okay, so what makes a good investment property? Well, first of all, before we go selecting the property itself, we must select the location. And when I say the location, I don't mean the lot within the suburb. What I mean is the town within the state or the suburb within the city. And we need to look, and even in that sense, look, the city itself. is The first question is, are prices going up? If prices aren't going up, don't buy there. That's just silly. It's an investment property. Why would you buy? You wouldn't buy shares in a company that's not going anywhere. Why would you buy shares in a, in a town that's not going anywhere? And that's what an investment property is. An investment property is a share in a town. And if you think about it that way, you'll remove all the emotion and you'll make the right decisions. If you think of the property as somewhere, oh, we might live there one day or we might, um, you know, uh, maybe we'll retire there and stuff like that, then you're heading for trouble because you're going to start making emotional decisions, not investment decisions. Don't worry about that. When you've made all your millions and you're ready to retire, then you can live wherever the hell you bloody well like. But up until that point, and you can buy a property and pay cash for it then, but up until that point, buy your investment properties where you're going to make money. It seems simple, doesn't it? But I can tell you right now, 90% of people are buying locally still. Why on earth would you do that? It's crazy. And it's almost like I'm on a personal mission to stop people from buying locally unless they live in a booming area. Okay, so that's the first thing. And what then what factors then, if we're going to buy where it's booming, how do we know where it's going to boom? And, uh, you know, how do we know where the next big thing is? Well, first of all, we look at a, the supply situation and uh, what it looks like in the coming years, whether there's going to be any ongoing supply of housing or whether they're going to run out. Um, and we look at demand. Are there people moving into the town? Are there new jobs being created? Um, you know, that sort of thing. If you find those two things, you're going to make money. If you don't find those two things, don't be surprised. And it is very hard in capital cities to pick when the capital cities are going to go off because they're such big, um, they're such big masses that you know you can't really predict what the economy is doing. Whereas if you go to a smaller regional centre where there's significant job creation, you might do a lot better. And if you read all the books written by all the Australian property uh, gurus, you'll see that's a consistent theme that they'll all tell you that often the best gains can be made in regional towns not the city. Okay, so then what sort of property should you buy when you have selected your location? And the answer to that, my answer to that is new, 
for the reason we already discussed, uh, depreciation, but also because you get warranties. You get a six-month warranty, 100% on anything, crack tile, broken door handle, what have you. But you also get a seven-year structural warranty. Now think about it. When you're buying a second-hand home, and I'm, I'm, I don't, you don't have to answer this publicly, but ask yourself this. If you owned a home that had problems and you were selling it to get rid of it, would you putty the cracks in the wall and give it a fresh coat of paint before you handed it over? And do you think that a building inspector is going to pick up everything in the one hour he's got to do his inspection before he's got to move to the next one? You know, and, and you know, look, building inspectors don't have x-ray machines. You know, they, they can do a bit. And if you ever read a building inspection report, you'll see that all it's just full of live, it's full of, uh, what do they call it, legal exclusions and disclaimers and things like that. So get out, of, you know, and, and there's a good reason for that. If you buy a new property, at least for the first six months, you can get any, anything that's wrong with it, you know, will be identified and it'll get fixed. And then structurally you've got seven years. So it's from a risk management perspective, it just makes really good sense to buy a new property. Second thing I've got there is residential. Why buy residential? Well, there's a few reasons for that. First of all, commercial property does tend to get a better rental yield. But the problem with that is on the flip side of that, the, uh, the lending rates for commercial property often have a higher interest rate. So that can sort of wipe out any extra, it can counteract any benefit from a higher rental yield. Also, the LVRs on a commercial property are quite low, often 60, maybe maximum 70%. So you have to tip in a 30% deposit. Now, why would you tip in a 30% deposit to buy a commercial property when you could do three 10% deposits and buy three times as much residential property? Both markets tend to move at about the same rate in terms of capital growth. So why on earth would you do it? The other thing you've got to watch with commercial property is that the rental vacancy, the vacancy periods between tenants can often be quite long because commercial property is very niche and whilst you might have one tenant, it might be great, but then the period in between might be a long time before you start getting some money. So you've got to be very careful of that as well. Commercial property is really for the big boys and girls who've made lots of money and can afford to accept a bit of risk in their portfolio because their portfolio is so large that they can absorb a bit of any vacancy or anything like that. Okay, and then middle of the market, why do I say middle of the market? First of all, lower end of the market is usually where the older properties are, so the maintenance costs are much higher, but it's also where you'll find most of the tenants from hell. And when I say that, I'm not being a snob. The majority of poor people are, of course, very good people, and having money doesn't necessarily mean, that has nothing to do with whether you're a good or bad person. But on the flip side of that, if you're a bad person, chances are you don't have a lot of money. Because if you're a bad tenant, it's because you have a lack of respect for authority and you have a lack of respect for other people's possessions, i.e. They let your landlord's house that they worked very hard to acquire and you're then renting from them. Now, if you've got that sort of attitude, you're probably not in a very highly paid job either. So because you probably haven't had a successful career and, you, and you're probably doing the, you know, the lower paid, smaller jobs. So if you stay away from the lower end of the market, you will stay away from the tenants from hell because that's where they live. And then in regards to the higher end of the market, first of all, why would you buy $2 million property in the high end of the market when you could buy four $500,000 properties in four different locations and spread your risk and make sure you're always making money somewhere? The other thing about the high, or the two other things about the high end of the market, tends to be very volatile. When the economy takes a dip, the high end of the market, the million dollar houses tend to take a very severe dip in their values. And the other reason why is the rental yields tend to be very low in the high end of the market because remember 90% of people aren't educated about money and they think that they should be buying their own home and, and not renting. So if anyone's got the capacity to pay the rent for an expensive property, they're probably buying their own property first before they go and rent. So the high end of the market, you want to stay away from that. So new residential middle of the market properties. And uh, if you do that, you're going to have good cash flow. There's always going to be demand for your property. You're going to get high LVRs, good tenants, good depreciation and uh, warranties for security. And, uh, and so that's, that's the Damien Patterson property investment criteria. I challenge you to challenge that um, if you wish. And at the end, we'll have some question time. You can ask those questions uh, if you wish. All right, moving right along. Okay, so how do you accumulate property? And this is the thing. This, I talk about the four phases to property investment. I talk about that in advanced training. But I talk about the save, save, save is the first phase. And that's where you just got to get that first property. 
And then there's the accumulation phase where you buy as many properties as you can without overextending yourself and making sure that throughout that process the properties are paying for themselves. And then you've got to stop buying and you've got to go to the consolidate phase, which is the third phase, which you, where you allow your properties just to go up in value and the rents to go up to such that the rents are much higher than the cost and you've got a surplus income that you can live off. And then you're in a position to retire, which is, of course, the fourth, the fourth phase. So how do we do that second phase? How do we accumulate? So let's say we buy that first property and we buy it for 350 and it's got a mortgage of 280 Well, as time goes by, if we've selected a good location, that property will go up in value. And in, in this case, hypothetical example, it's gone up to 500 grand. Now, 80% is no longer 280 80% is now 400 grand, and the loan itself is, in a relative sense, down here at 280 So we have this available equity now, don't we, as we calculate it? And that is, say, 120 grand in this case. So we now know that we could borrow up to 120 grand and use that to buy another property. So what we do is we go to the first bank and the first property, say, second loan, please, for investment purposes against the first property, and we use that to buy an investment property. And that pays the deposit and cost, and then we go and get an 80% loan on that. Now, you can do it with 80% loans if you want to be conservative, or you can really gear it up and do 90% loans. Uh, that's up to you. Um, but, you know, obviously the higher the debt, the more the cost base will be and the less likely the property is to pay for itself. So you've got to, it's always a balancing act between that. And that's why a good, rent, healthy rental yield will always help out. Okay, so what happens is that first property goes up in value, gives birth to another. And one property becomes two. Time goes by and they continue to go up, the first property continues to go up in value and it gives birth to another one, but so does the second one. And two have become four. And then four become eight, and eight becomes 16, and 16 becomes 32, and so on, and exponentially it grows. And this is where a lot of people miss the boat. They don't understand the game. They don't understand how to play it. They buy that first property in the wrong place, doesn't go up in value, and then they can't get that second property. Well, they buy a negatively geared property, and they get to two properties, and then they can't afford to buy anymore because the, other, the two they've got are burning a hole in their pocket. So this is why it's so important. Buy where it's booming so that they go up in value in the quicker, sooner rather than later, and you can leapfrog from one to the next. And make sure your properties pay for themselves, because I'll tell you what, when you've got 20 properties, you want to make sure they all pay for themselves. And that's, that's how we accumulate property, really simple. Buy where it's booming, go up in value, leverage, get the equity out, buy another one, and so on. Okay, so how to get started. Some of you listening tonight may already have your own home that's got available equity in it. And up until tonight, you've probably been telling yourself that the goal was to pay that house off. And what I'd say to you is the goal is to pay your house off, but only when you want to retire. Before then, while you're still working, it, may, it might make more sense to get into some investment properties and use your equity that you've got in your own home to buy a whole heap of property. Because when the market doubles in value, are you going to make more money if you own $2 million worth of property or are you going to make more money if you sit on what you've got and keep trying to pay the mortgage off? See, the big money's in capital growth, not paying off a mortgage. That's the hard way to do it. And what you can do is, you know, if you go on it and get, if you've got half a million dollar property now and you're close to paying it off and then you go, well, okay, we might try what Damien's suggesting and go and get three investment properties and, and have $2 million worth of property instead and carry a bit of debt on our place as a temporary measure, well, when the market doubles in value, in, historic, in the 70s it quadrupled in value, in the 80s it tripled, in the 90s it doubled, in the last decade it doubled. So, you know, the worst case scenario in the last 40 years has been it's doubled in 10 years. So in 10 years from now, your $2 million portfolio could be worth $4 million. And your debt situation will be less than $2 million because you won't load up any more debt once you've got your portfolio. And then you could take that $2 million of equity, you could refinance one of those investment properties, um, increase the debt on that and use that money from that debt, from that loan to pay out your own loan. You could sell one of the investment properties and use the, the equity that you've cashed in on to pay out your loan. Do it all in the day. Stop slugging away at your mortgage. That's the old way and it's not the smart way. The smart way is to use, is to use big chunks of equity from other properties to smash your mortgage in a single day. And uh, the only way you can do that is by having more investment properties. Okay, so how to get started? Obviously, if you don't have if you don't have any money and you don't have any property, you, there's no point in avoiding it. You're just going to have to save for a deposit. 
And uh, but if you already have equity, or you might even you might even have some super money that you could put in a self managed super fund and buy a property that way. And we can certainly help people do that if that's an option. Um, use existing equity or use your super. So these are your options. If you've got equity in your home, you can buy an investment property now. If you've got available equity, that is. If you've got superannuation, then more than, say, $100,000, chances are you could roll that into a self-managed super fund and buy your first investment property. And if you've got about fifty grand, then, you, then you're probably in cash, then, you, then you're in a position to buy an investment property with that as well, potentially. Okay, the other option you've got is what joint venture, but I do say this with extreme caution. Proceed with caution. One way might be to go in with someone else who's got the funds, but just any joint venture should always be deemed as a temporary a temporary enterprise to get you on the ladder. And then the first moment you've got to pay the other partner out, you should do that. And there's a number of reasons for that. I won't go too far in it tonight, but you know, um, it, first of all, the banks assume that you owe all the money. Um, but they only credit you with half the rent, um, which is interesting the way they calculate you know, your net position uh, if you're in a 50-50 joint venture. Probably the, the only joint venture that I, would, that I would even suggest anyone entertains might be a young, young couple who are trying to get in their first property and they go to mum and dad and they say, mum, can we raise a small loan against your property and then we'll pay that loan off for you and then we'll use that as our deposit and cost and then when, when we're in a position to pay that loan out, we'll do that for you. That might be a good way of helping your kids um, rather than just giving them a handout, um, giving them the money in cash, maybe just let them draw a loan against your property and, and, and do that way. Um, but just proceed with caution, that sort of thing. And even though their family should always get some paperwork drawn up so you can hold them to account. Okay, what's the process of buying a property? Okay, first of all, you should sit down and talk to someone who knows what they're doing coaching and planning session and come up with a strategy. Make sure you understand what your options are and make sure you've got a plan. Then go out and do your location and property selection and make sure you're getting assistance with that. Um, we obviously go to a lot of effort to help our clients do that. We have a full-time research department and their job is to keep their finger on the pulse of where the good places to buy are and where they aren't. Um, then once you've got a property, don't fear doing a contract as long as You've got you understand how your cooling off period works, and you understand and you put a buyer's choice finance clause, and those two words are very important. Buyer's choice finance clause needs to go on the paperwork because there's no such thing as a pre, as a pre-approval these days. The banks will tell you, "Oh, we'll give you a pre-approval to buy a property." They're not really because when you do buy a property, you'll have to apply for it again because the bank will want to see the contract, they want to see the selling price, they want to see what it's going to rent for, and what have you. Um, so. You do have to go through that process anyway, so don't be afraid to sign a contract, but as long as you've got a finance clause in there and the cooling off period and you understand uh, what you're doing. And if you've never, if it's your first property, make sure you read that contract from front to back, okay? Just out of principle. All right. Then you go and get your legal advice. And when you uh, get a, when you buy a property, you'll get a, a, you need a conveyancing solicitor and what they will do is they'll read that contract and they'll write you a very simple summary letter before your cooling off period expires and they'll tell you what you're committing to. So, And if you don't like what you're committing to, you can punch you out of that. But if you do a buyer's choice finance clause, you've got the option there to get out under the finance clause. Buyer's choice very important words because then it's they can't say, like a vendor, a supplier uh, you know, or developer could offer you finance and they say, I'll give you the finance. And then you're like, oh, gee, well, I can't get out. But if you've got buyer's choice finance clause, then... It's up to you and you can say, no, I'm not happy with that and I'm out. Uh, finance, then once you've done that, your finance application, good break will put the finance application in and seek to get your approval. And then you want to send in the building inspector, make sure the property is good to go and start lining up a rental manager. So the day that the keys are handed over, you can rent the property out straight away and you don't have to pay the mortgage. The tenant will do that for you. Uh, then, the, then the settlement will occur where you take ownership of the property Get the quantity surveyor in there to do your depreciation schedule for you, and then hold that property and wait. And that, that's really the, all the hard work's done at that stage. Now you just got to let the market do its work. And look, it may take a couple of years. It may take five years. Uh, if you get if you do it, if you get lucky, you might do it in a year. And you know, I've done that, and I've done it in a year before, and I've done it for clients in a year. But the market's, you know, in some years it's good, and some years it's not as good. So you just have to wait sometimes. And then hold that property, rent, wait till your rents go up and your values rise, 
and then you can repeat the process and access that new equity and get on with it. Okay, getting a team of experts is really, really important. Uh, mortgage broker, I'll tell you now, and uh, our good friend uh, Wayne is watching tonight. He's a fan, fantastic mortgage broker. Um, but nine out of ten mortgage brokers probably don't know how to look after investors properly. And uh, if you are um, thinking about you know, building a portfolio, the first thing I can say to you is use a broker, don't go through your bank because your bank will stitch you up every day of the week and you'll get to about four properties and they won't lend you any money anymore and we talk about that in advanced strategies. So stay away, always use a different lender per bank and choose very carefully. You need a good mortgage broker and that person should be with you throughout your um, property investing career for want of a better term. Okay, solicitor. Now the solicitor it needs to be independent, of course, and looking after your best interests. They'll oversee any paperwork and make sure that um, you know there's nothing sneaky snuck in there. Quantity surveyor does your depreciation schedule so you can claim your tax benefits. Building inspector, depending on where you buy, there'd be a different building inspector every town. Make sure you get a good one. And usually, if you need any of these services, we can, of course, help you out in, in sourcing. Um, Safety and quality, of course. Building inspector, very good. Interesting thing about buying a new property. Uh, when you buy a brand new property, um, generally a building inspector is all you need. You don't necessarily need a pest inspector because if the property is brand new, uh, the building there'll be no opportunity for pests to have established. And if there was, the builder would have checked it out. But the builder will also uh, check things like termite protection barriers have been installed correctly. But look, for peace of mind, you can get a pest inspector on a new property, but often it's unnecessary. Uh, rental managers are really important. Um, again, there are good rental managers and there are bad rental managers. A couple of questions I always ask a rental manager. First of all, I say, do you own the investment property? If, they don't own, if the rental manager doesn't own the investment property, do not let them, or at the very least a property, do not let them manage your property. You know, if it's a 19-year-old um, you know, girl working in the rental office, and uh, I would suggest that you think twice about that because... Chances are if they're a renter themselves and they're not yet to learn what it means to own a property and have that responsibility, I'm not saying all of them, but I'm saying the good, good chances that they're going to side with the tenant, they're going to be sympathetic to the tenant, turn a blind eye, maybe pay a few things off and not going to serve you well. The best rental managers are the people who own property themselves and therefore respect um, your rights as a landlord, respect the fact that you've worked very hard to, um, to get that property and they will look after it as if it was their own. Um, good rental manager will, of course, look after any maintenance and repairs, and in particular, if you're buying where it's booming and you're not buying locally, as you should, um, you know you need a really good rental manager to make sure that the local tradies are fixing anything that needs to be fixed and they're doing it for a cost-effective you know, cost way and not, not wasting your money. It's important they do regular inspections, and you should always ask your rental manager to provide you photos of an inspection. That way, they're, they're forced to actually physically go there and they can't hoodwink you and just send you some templated report that they didn't really do um, or just grab the last report and, um, and send you the same report with, with a new date on it. They'll also handle any disputes for you and chase up your overdue rent and things like that. Always think twice about renting a property out privately. Um, on one hand, you might save some money, but on the other hand, what you do is you get emotionally involved. And then you might get if you you know you might get drawn into the sob story of the tenant about how their cat died and their grandmother died and they've got to help out Uncle Arthur, and the next thing you know you're feeling sorry for them and you can't bring yourself to hold hold their feet to the fire on uh, on paying the rent, and that's a real problem for you because if they don't pay the rent you have to, and uh, so it's always better just to get that rental manager in there and just hold them to the letter of the law, and and you know get yourself removed from any uh, emotional conflict. And then they oversee any sort of rent increases as well. Good rental manager, every time your lease expires, they'll give you a call and say, look, the market's moved. We recommend you renew, you know, you, you renew the lease at this, at this price. Okay. So where to go from here uh, if you want any more help? We've started running these one-day uh, property investor training events. So I think they're really important. They're not a seminar. They're not a workshop. I've been to plenty of those, and I think they're rubbish. All they are is sellophons you know, like the Tuesday night um, live event where they say rush to the back of the room and, and get a uh, you know a free set of steak knives for the first 12 people to sign up. We're not into that sort of thing. Um, 
what we're into as a company is providing people with an education so they understand what they're doing. And then if they want to use our services, then fantastic, and we'd love to help them. But if they don't, that's okay too. Um, so what we do is we run these one-day training events, and um, this is some of the stuff we cover. These are live events. You get to, see, get to meet me in the flesh, limiting beliefs and obstacles and how to overcome them. We talk about historical market data. We sort of go to another level of detail. Optimal finance structures, uh, the golden rules of property investment strategies, how to build your portfolio faster, how to maximise your cash flow. We go right into how to select your team, all of those things. Um, we have lunch together, morning tea, and you know, we take a nice light pace throughout the day, but we do it. Uh, we make sure that we're sort of getting there. And then from there, you know, you, you'll come away from that um, you know, enormously more confident uh, and competent about property investing. And uh, I've, uh, I've put the challenge to people. I've said, look, if you don't feel that it was worth your day, then I'll buy you dinner, and no one's asked me to buy them dinner yet. So <laughs> the, um, it, we get really good positive feedback about these training days. Um, I've even been told that I should approach the education department on one occasion there to, <laughs> because this stuff should be taught in schools. But just like anything, if you want to be successful at it, it makes sense to go and learn the lessons that other people have already learnt rather than blindly going out there and trying to do it all for yourself. And that's what these these training days are all about. So these are the dates we've got for the rest of the year and I apologise to anybody who's not in one of these locations or not able to get to one of these locations. If that is, if you're not able to get to one of these locations, I'm quite happy to, uh, to help you one-on-one uh, -on -one and we can do Skype and we can talk about things. It'll just be a bit of a slower process, of course, because, you know, I, I am in... I am a pretty popular boy these days, if I do say so myself, so my time is quite challenged. And uh, it, it, it's really, these days are good for me because I can have, you know, 30 people in the room and I can, um, you know, teach everyone at the same time those things. And then after that, you know, we can have a one-on-one -on -one session with me then and, and, we, and we, you know, it's more efficient use of time. Um, so, but if you can't get to one of those events, that's okay. I'm still happy to, to sit down and talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. But instead of it taking less than an hour, it might take three to three or so hours uh, and maybe over a couple of sessions before we come up with a plan that you're comfortable with. So there's our location. Now, if you'd like to go to one of those, please just put in your question box. This GoToWebinar system records, uh, obviously, when you register, you put your name and your email in there, so we'll record that, and it'll record any questions you ask. So all you need to do is just put training in whatever venue, whichever one of those you want to go to, um, and uh, obviously the Friday one, we did that last Friday, but we're going to Melbourne next weekend. We're going to Townsville, Brisbane, Canberra, Sydney, Adelaide, um, and then Melbourne again. You'll note some of those are on Fridays, some of those are on Saturdays. Um, if you like, if you can't, not available for that and you just want to have an appointment with me, that's okay too. Just put appointment please in there and, uh, and then we go from there. And other than that, I'll take your, I'll take your questions. So if you've got any questions, just type them into the into the, the box there. Okay. Well, let me just... Uh, expanding my little thing here. So, so. Okay, great. Okay, got a question there from Dennis. Uh, Dennis would like to come to Sydney. Fantastic, Dennis. I look forward to seeing you there. We'll make sure that you get sent some information about that. Um, how do you find booming areas? Well, look, we can help you do that. Um, we have a full-time researcher, um, you know, Mandy, and she's assisted by a research officer, Charmy, and uh, they're both very, very good. Mandy's got a background in uh, military intelligence, actually, and she loves a property investment. And uh, she gets out on the ground and goes, you know, snooping around, establishing network of informants, people in the media, people who work for town planning officers, uh, people who work in industry, uh, local real estate agents, we, we you know re reads all the stuff that people like Terry Ryder uh, write about, uh, does all that for you. It's a, it's her full time job. She's very very valuable to our company because we understand that if we put people in the right place, that their properties are going to go up in value sooner rather than later, and then they're and then you know they're going to be successful property investors as a result, and they're going to tell all their friends, and then you know our business will take care of itself if we do that. So. Um, the way to look, the way to find booming areas when you come along uh, to Sydney, uh, you will, um, or any one of these days for everyone else, 
we talk, there's a whole one hour session about how we talk about how to identify a boom area. Um, I have my favourite spots and I'll be happy to share them with you uh, on the day, Dennis. Um, so, but yeah, basically look for those areas where there is uh, job creation is probably the big one. Um, you want where there's money being spent, um, you know, so places where, where jobs are going down is probably not a good place to invest because remember who buys, who buys houses? And, you know, people with jobs buy houses. That's who buys houses, people with jobs. So why would you, if you want to make some money, you go places where there's jobs being created. Um, you know, and if you, if you want to lose money, go places where there's jobs being disbanded, I suppose. And Australia is interesting, isn't it? You know, Australia is going through a transition at the moment. A lot of people don't realise, but we are going through a transition from what was traditionally a manufacturing and agriculture economy to a almost entirely resources economy. Energy and metals is uh, our whole country is going to just be reliant on that. And uh, because we can't compete uh, labour costs, we can't compete on agriculture, and we can't compete on manufacturing. That's why the every year you'll see, you know, the Adelaide. Uh, Mitsubishi plant getting closed down, the Geelong plant's going to be, Ford factory's going to be closed down and then the government swoops in and tries to rescue it and all that sort of stuff. And uh, But that's that's just a reflection of the time we're in. So in terms of uh, where it's booming, where are the jobs being created? Well, they're being created in places in the resource states, Queensland, Northern Territory and WA. And um, and then it's really, though, you've got to be very, very careful about where you invest in each of those areas. Okay. I um, hope that answered your question, Dennis, and of course, uh, when we see you in Sydney, mate, we'll go right into detail about that. Um, I've got a question there from Cathy. Hi, Cathy. Uh, what do I think of Perth? Uh, look, I think Perth, is its fate is tied to the iron ore sector. WA, um, obviously WA has a whole heap of different industries, but the, uh, the absolute dominant industry is the iron ore in northern WA. That's where the big money is. When iron ore is strong, a couple of years later, Perth takes off. As soon as iron ore takes a dip, Perth takes a dip. And um, I would think that at the moment, uh, I would just wait and see with Perth. Um, I'd wait and see what effect the carbon t the removal of the carbon tax and the mining tax has on um, on the mining industry in that area. But look, long term, Perth's an easy bet. Um, you're going to make money in 10 years from now. Are you going to have made money in Perth? Absolutely, no problem at all. Is it, the, is it in my top 10? Um, yes. Is it in my top 5? Probably not. Um, I'm happy to talk to you, Cathy, about uh, you know, different options. Okay. Um, hold on. How long do you expect those for? Yeah, Jeff, the situation in Gladstone, I, I think it's going to be, uh, there's an interesting situation in Gladstone for the benefit of everyone else. Gladstone is a, is a, is a Booming location, great location, lots of jobs being created. However, with the uh, with the introduction of the carbon and mining taxes, it did sort of put the the the, the uh, brakes on a bit there. And also, there's been two two estates in Gladstone have come online at the same time. So there's a bit of a temporary oversupply there at the moment. A lot of people are saying, a lot of less educated people are saying um, that it's all over for Gladstone. Whereas I beg to differ quite significantly, and um, our, we've been on the ground there. We know what's really going on. And basically these two estates that are coming online in Gladstone now, they're the last two estates uh, in, that, in Gladstone itself. And you can see that by the developers are all going further, going down south to Tannum Sands and Calliope and places like that. So whilst they may be uh, the jobs, the demand for those properties at the moment is a bit slow, um, I believe that by the end of the year that will be cleared out. The information I'm getting is that it's already starting to turn now, and uh, by the end of the year that'll be it'll be onwards and upwards again in that part of the world. And uh, we know that um, even last week, the another one of the gas works was was given full approval. We know that uh, there's a steel plant going in next year. There's a whole heap of stuff going on. I think everyone was just holding their breath, waiting for the um, the government to change. And for something, and they're probably still holding their breath to a certain extent to to see whether this carbon removal of the carbon tax and mining tax will indeed um, be be followed through with. And I and I think my assessment of that is yes, it will, um, because the Senate, all the independent, whilst the Liberals don't have a balance of power in the uh, in the Senate, 
all the independents that are getting into the Senate appear to be more likely to support the Liberals than they are to support Labor. So therefore, um, we shouldn't see that getting blocked. Um, okay, so Jeff, I'm happy to talk to you. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you on, on Friday uh, next week. Okay, has the Hunter Valley lost its shine um, for investment? Uh, look, the Hunter Valley is suffering the same fate as um, some of the coal sectors, Lynn, and uh, good to see you online, Lynn, and I uh, hope you're well. The, um, it's all about coal, and the coal price is right down at the moment. And this is one of the risks that um, the property investment has. I say to people, be very wary of buying in a one-horse town because and a one-horse town might be defined as you know one major employer or it might be uh, one major industry. And if you're in a one major industry town and the, that commodity, in the example of coal, if that commodity takes, a, takes a, buy, a dive, which coal has done at the moment, well, then you should expect that that property market is going to be affected by that. What we do know about coal, which is quite interesting at the moment, is that the coal price is down, but the volume of coal is, is at record levels. So the demand for coal is still there in terms of volume, but it, they just can't sell it as, uh, for the same high price they were getting before. And so what happens is the companies, what they, they start offloading all their subcontractors. They start doing things like um, getting rid of jobs, um, getting rid of jobs where there's um, you know, someone on 90 grand, they might disestablish that job and then rehire someone for 70 grand in that position just to cut costs. So they're still doing production, but you know, they're losing jobs, adding jobs, things like that. And um, so yeah, so they're still maintaining production, but they're looking at ways, because the, coal, because the price is so low, they're looking at ways to increase their profit. And uh, if you can't put your price up, anyone in business knows that if you can't put your price up, then the next thing to do is cut your costs. And so that's naturally what they're doing. When coal was at 250 a ton, they were making, you know, pardon the French, shitloads of money, and they were being very lazy about their costs. Now that they're only getting 150 dollars a ton, they're being very mindful of their costs, and they're, and they're getting rid of a lot of subcontractors and things like that. Um, also, too, a lot of that uh, booming that's occurred in those areas has been due to mine expansions. And when you do a construction or a or an expansion sort of project, that tends to bring in a lot of construction workers. And then once that's over, um, those workers go away and you might have increased operational numbers, but that's not going to be as much as the uh, construction numbers. So you've got to watch that. Um, okay, so uh, I've got another question here. What do I think of Claremont, Roma, Chinchilla area? Um, okay, well, that's quite a stretch. Claremont will be very, very careful of, Nathan, um, there's only two mines in Claremont and they're both coal mines from what I understand and there's talk, whilst one of them's being uh, started up and expanding, I believe the other one's closing down so I have a real concern about Claremont. Roma uh, is getting a bit of gas as well which is good but Roma's right out on the edge of the field and it's, also, it's one of the furthest towns out so I, I would have concerns that if things did start to contract that Roma might be one of the first areas to, to sort of contract from. Chinchilla, I like. Uh, Chinchilla and Moles close together. I like those areas. However, they are risky. Um, there's lots of coal seam gas type stuff going on there. And when the coal price recovers, Chinchilla uh, and that part of the world will dramatically go off because from what our, our research has said, there's about 40 different coal projects proposed that are currently on hold in that area. So as soon as the coal price comes up, those projects should then kick off and then they'll need workers and you'll have a massive influx again. The problem with those towns too, though, is that they are uh, country towns and there is plenty of land supply, so it's not too hard for um, a developer to go in there and, um, and just buy another farm and subdivide it. So I would, you can do well there, and, and I've recommended clients buy in Chiller in the past and they've made money there. At the moment, uh, I'm sort of, I'm not, uh, just at the moment. I, I think that there's a bit, with the coal price being down, it's wise just to sort of sit that out for a while and wait till it recovers. Okay. Um, got some great feedback there from Stan. Thank you, Stan. Stan's asked what are the two new estates in Gladstone. Those estates are Forest Springs and um, Forest Springs and Brookview. And there's, there's, a, there's another one, Little Creek, which is just about complete. There's only a couple of blocks left in there. Um, so that's, that's pretty much done. Forest Springs and Brookview are the ones at the moment that are, are sort of creating a bit of oversupply. But it's a good opportunity. Uh, look, we're still putting people into Gladstone because right now you can get a bloody good deal um, and uh, you can get a, get a property that 
you know, for a good price that I that I firmly believe in, you know, in eighteen months' time is going to be worth more, certainly worth more than it is now. But of course, I don't control the market, and uh, you know, a nuclear bomb could go off. And <laughs> but look, all indications are that it's uh, it's a great place to go. So I hope hope that answers your question, Stan. Uh, if you are interested in 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 uh, Gladstone Stan, then do make sure you touch base with us because we do know that market very well and we know what what is available there and and what's a good deal and what's not. Uh, okay, if you've asked a question and I've missed it, please retype it because I um, please retype it because I uh, I'm not seeing it. Otherwise, I'm, we might wrap it up if there's no other questions. Okay, not seeing any more questions. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming along this evening. Um, do I would love to see you at one of our training days. Um, some of them are on Fridays. We do do them on Saturdays every now and then, but, I look, you know, this is my job as well, and I have a family, so I do like to, to try. My, my weekends are just as precious as yours um, are to you. But uh, we do run them occasionally on Saturday, so if you, if you can only do a Saturday, make sure you swoop in and grab one of those because we won't be doing many of them. Um, but look, you know, property investment's a fantastic opportunity for the average Australian uh, to to really get ahead and to do it in a in a relatively safe and conservative manner. Um, but if you're nervous about doing it, it's probably because you don't know enough about the subject. So go along to one of these events. Go along, get that education you need. Spend more, you know. Contact me and have a one-on-one -on -one with me if, if if you need to do that too, and we'll be happy to to help you uh, to get a hit. Okay, and and on that note, if there's no further questions, I uh, I look forward to seeing you all at one of those events. I look forward to seeing you on our future webinars. And if you've got any individual questions or you'd like to have a chat, feel free to contact us tomorrow, uh, either via email or the number on the screen. Bye. Thank you for your time and good night.